She's done other things besides responsibility-driven design, a lot of object design stuff in the early days, but also uh, some really thing, interesting things with um, architectural assessments that I uh, was very interested in a few years ago that she was talking about. But tonight she's going to talk about heuristics, and I won't try to elaborate on that talk itself, but I'm looking forward to hearing it. And so uh, let me just turn it over uh, to Rebecca. This figure that you see in front of you is an Ouroboros. And it's a serpent, you know, from the Greek mythology where it's devouring its tail, but it never dies. It's in this endless cycle of rebirth, renewal, and regrowth. And from my point of view as a software designer, sometimes design feels like that, right? It's not like we're chasing our tails, um, but, <laughs> but it is the case that we have to build stuff and it goes through this life cycle and we, and we figure out that we might have done it a better way and then we reintegrate those new learnings into our own set of heuristics and then build again and learn from that, um, as well as from other people that write books and blogs and, and whatever. Um, so just before I start, I want to give you a definition of a uh, heuristic that I'm going to be using in this talk, because this talk is about you as designers cultivating your heuristics. What do I mean by heuristic? And I'm inspired by Billy Vaughn Cohn. He's like, he doesn't even look like a great-grandfatherly <laughs> figure. He actually was a professor and did design nuclear reactors okay, for, for, a, for a living. And so he really had to uh, you know, build things that were reliable over time. But one of the things that he says in this book, which is a more of a philosophy book than anything else, is that a heuristic, and that's a definition that I'm going to use, is anything that provides a plausible aid, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and you can't really justify it. It's what you do, and you know at the, at the point in time that you apply it, uh, and it might not work. But you do it anyway. And that's coming from a guy who de designed nuclear reactors. So anyway, just something to think about. Uh, a little Our software isn't quite so consequential unless some of you are building military software, and I don't know, want to know about that. Um, but anyway, let's talk about the nature of heuristics. If I'm cultivating my heuristics, the set of things that I do or I try in order to build a system, they aid me in what my design looks like. Um, they might be meta heuristics, heuristics that guide what I do. Um, about how I work, and even our attitude and behavior, like how do we think about our design and our work that we're creating. Just to give you, for instance, how many of you have uh, seen the manifesto for software craftsmanship? Yeah, all right. There's attitude there. It says, not only working software, but well-crafted, right? So whatever I'm going to do is going to mean that it's going to be well-crafted. It's not going to be crap. Um, I'm not responding to change like the Agile Manifesto said, but I want to add value as I do so. So I can't, uh, you know, they're not devouring themselves faster than they, than they, so that attitude is part of their heuristics too. So one of the questions to ask yourself about heuristics in general is, what do they look like? You know, what's a heuristic? Um, if you, um, are they pithy phrases? Um, here's some heuristics that were in Cohn's book, this philosophy book, and you know they were solve problems by successive approximations, and uh, always give an answer. So if you have to do something, apply what you need to do right then. You know, so so don't you know use the best mechanism you know right now. Don't don't overwork it. And, and I like this one, it sounds very agile. Always give yourself a chance to retreat from a, you know, if you're designing that, that you need to back up and try again. That's interesting from a nuclear reactor 
designer uh, to think about. Um, and that you want to use feedback to stabilize your design so that you don't want to design, 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 build, build, build feedback, but you um, want to get feedback as you go to stabilize your design, break things down into small pieces, always make the minimum decision. I thought that was interesting. You know, don't over-engineer is how I would say that. But on the other hand, um, what he says, one of the heuristics is design for a specific time frame. So, and, you know, which means like, how long is this thing supposed to exist without breaking? And the nuclear reactors, in theory, are supposed to exist for a long time. One of the things I think that's hard about software is we underestimate the lives of our software, right? So, so we build things and we think, ah, it's going to be replaced in three years, but it keeps living, all right? Um, and so one of the things uh, that he talks about, this notion that I find is important and I want to have you think about as you cultivate and think about the heuristics that you apply to design, is that every, every designer has their own personal state of the art, the set of heuristics that they apply to what they're doing and what they've done when they create something. And uh, so that's a state of the art, or soda, as you, you might uh, use that term. And that whenever you like want to pivot and do new things, he says, D don't don't just throw everything you knew out the window, and but make small changes to your state of the art. You know, so so as I grow and learn, it's not like I chop off part of that tail and and grow a new whole new thing. I'm it's rebirth. It's an it's an evolutionary process. So <clears throat> for us software people <clears throat> and. Um, I consider myself an insider in the patterns community now, now that I've been writing patterns for about 10 years. Probably I started writing patterns about the time people forgot to start reading patterns. But, but anyway, um, so I've been writing patterns for lately for a few years. One of the things I like about patterns, and you know, in Eric's book is written in patterns, even though you probably don't call them that way, um, is that they're nicely packaged heuristics. They're not just pithy little phrases. They say, well, what si situation can I use this? They tell you uh, what the problem is, what questions does it answer. They kind of give you a sketch of a solution. Don't think that you want to do it exactly that way. Um, and, and, and that's kind of a nice packaging of heuristics. Um, and so if you look at the pattern map, I'll call it not a mind map, but a pattern map of the domain-driven design uh, patterns, you'll see that there are patterns and there's uh, uh, a relation, not only are they there in space, but there's a um, relationship between them indicated by those arrows, right? And so if I'm doing model-driven design, if I want to uh, express the model, I can do, do it through services. And if I want to express change to that model over its life cycle, I do domain events. And, and, so, and, then, and then there's more details. So, so that there's this collected set of patterns you can apply. Um, and if you read beyond chapter uh, four, you would know that these ones down here are things that you should do as well. You know, we've had talks today where people said, well, I just did these ones because they were the tech techie ones and, and, and I learned more from that. But anyway, um, the notion of a pattern language is something to think about in that um, Christopher Alexander, who inspired us, who write, uh, wrote about patterns, is that you don't want to write one pattern. You don't even want to apply one pattern. But it only exists in the world because there's a network of these things. And so if I think of patterns as um, packaged heuristics, if you will, that there are little ones and there are bigger ones and there are ones that are sort of higher level things that I do from, my, from a design perspective and there are lower level ones. And you know you have to realize that it's a rich thing. They're not all at the same level, um, but a language is something that guides you uh, to 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 solving your problem through a collected set of heuristics. But us so software patterns writers uh, can't tell everything, right? No, 
I feel like Swiss cheese. It's full of holes. No pattern languages are ever complete. At least I haven't ever seen one for software. Um, so there's probably there should be more holes than there are. I mean, there are things that you have to figure out as a designer that are never explained in any pattern language. Um, and some pattern languages, this is actually well-aged cheese, by the way, artisan cheese, not crappy cheese. Some patterns age really well, and some, some heuristics, as well as patterns that are just a form of heuristics, don't age so well. So that's just something to be aware of. The other thing uh, that von Kohn talks about, that as you, as a, someone who wants to cultivate and grow your heuristics, is that heuristics may conflict, and, and, and they're still equally useful, right? So you, as a designer, have to pick what one you're going to use. And how many of you have ever been on a team where people don't agree on that? Right? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Boy, so many, yeah, right. OK. Um, so you have to develop your sense of style unless you want chaos to reign about the heuristics that you're going to apply. Um, and so, so they conflict. They compete. There's alternate ways to building uh, and, and moving us forward in our design. Just to give you an, a quick example of that uh, from, from you know, the patterns of enterprise application architecture, and I'm, I'm not picking on this, it's just, it's a classic, so most of you would, would know this. You know, there's, I've, I've turned these into pithy heuristics. You want to use a transaction script when you have simple logic, right? And you use a domain model when you have complex logic, whatever that means. And, and that you can accommodate objects, so I'm going to say, that, that can deal with that mapping issue. And use that table thing whenever you um, have complex existing data, primarily, and you need to write logic. And it would be nice if it could apply to multiple rows rather than a single instance. So, so that, that's the heuristics you might pick out from, from Fowler's uh, patterns and, and use pithy phrases around them. So what do I do as a designer who's going to apply heuristics? There's the solvable problems, and then there's my problems. Hopefully, it's in that space of solvable problems. Right, there's my problem. And yeah, there's this domain model heuristic. Yeah, I think it will fit in there, right? Um, but we also know that there's this table model. There's an overlap of you know, uh, competing heuristics. And you know, if I'm really in love with the domain model, that one will appear first, which that did. And, and the table model is something I might use. And yeah, you know, really, there was this transaction script uh, that Fowler talked about. But because I'm so cool and I want to do objects or, or active records and stuff, you know, I, yeah, that one goes away. So what you do, actually, when you're absorbing heuristics, and, and applying them as you're doing it, it's like you're unconsciously strengthening the biases that you have about what you're going to build. You're creating your set of personal heuristics. Um, and I'm not saying that, that this is the end of what you do, because you want to constantly learn and grow and evolve what you do. But So you make a choice, and you, and you live with it for a while. Um, so one of the things... But you need to remember that there are always competing alternative heuristics out there. Um, I would have liked that patterned authors labeled uh, competing heuristics so nicely so I could pick them out, but I've found that I have to do more of that than they, they told me. Um, just to just say. And you always need to challenge heuristics if you want to grow and, and develop your set of heuristics. So, if I take these three heuristics from Fowler, and, and, and how, how can I challenge them? In the real world, there's other stuff out there that I've seen, and I've built some of them. What about those stored procedures? I, I won't tell you the worst system I've ever seen, but it had stored procedures with 100 argument methods um, in it. That was very scary. I did not build it. I, I did an assessment, you know, as Paul said. Wow, I went, oh, shit. Anyway, OK, <laughs> all right. Um, 
And then there's, you know, rules engines and simpler domain models, you know, or anemic or whatever. Um, and so, how do I challenge what I read about or, you know, someone's pitching with what I've seen and, and done? Fowler has, you need to kind of weigh and, and compare it, you know, put your judgment into it. So Fowler had this uh, uh, effort to enhance versus complexity of the domain logic, and he put these um, three ways of doing it into, you know, if I want to do this, uh, transaction scripts go great, but as soon as you hit a complexity curve, the effort goes way up high. So that he's like, you don't think he liked transaction scripts when things got complex. Um, so I might put my uh, take on it with database scripts. Um, is that like, okay, as soon as things get even slightly complex, they get very hairy to debug and 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 change. Um, and the rules engines, I, I would put the rules engines similarly, but I just wanted to show just one heuristic bouncing a, a, a against that. And what about potential code reuse? This is what Fowler had for those. And if I think about rule, database scripts, I was being optimistic about that. I think I gave it a longer curve than it should have had, because there's probably very little reuse. Um, so that's you know, how you internalize your heuristics that you see. And you realize, and please do not beat up the pattern writers, because they write about what they know and love and see work, and they don't want to write about all the things that they don't want you to not do. Um, so they, you know, that's why rules engines weren't written up in the patterns of enterprise, I, I suspect. Um, so, so in some sense, you probably mentally come up with this sort of best fit profile at some point in time when you're, you know, your state of the art, you know, it, it, based on design skills and some driving forces, um, maybe um, the duration, the complexity, the longevity, which you'll never get right, but you'll come up with some assessment like that. And there's always going to be disagreement. So just, just deal with that. There, there will be disagreement. Um, but you, as you develop your heuristics and your sense of what you think works, you learn a lot by bouncing your preferred heuristics, and everybody has their state of the art, and experience off of others. And so I actually think the best way to learn about stuff is to have a either in-person or a uh, you know imaginary argument or discussion with someone who has a differing per, uh, opinion that you can't wrap your head around, that you don't agree with. Uh, so, so just to say this, you know, uh, Paul Graham, pretty famous guy, um, um, he, he's, he said, in essence, the more demanding applications are, you know, the programming language really matters in that case. But plenty of projects aren't demanding at all. Programming is mainly writing blue code and just use any language you're familiar with and has good libraries for what you need to do and just get on with it. <clears throat> so I'm going to have my argument with Paul. Um, it doesn't matter what programming language you use. If it's simple programming, use tools and frameworks you're familiar with, right? That's what he would say. And I'm going, but Paul, wait a minute. If I have rich domain model, and behavior, even if it's simple, I, I'm an object person. I want to want to do that. Or you know, if it's really simple and isn't going to change much, I can use transaction scripts. But man, why do I have to keep using the same stuff over and over again? I'm not learning anything from that. Uh, don't always do things the same way because that's soul sucking. Right? That might be one of my arguments. On the other hand, I can hear, hear my boss, and I haven't had a boss for a long, long time, but I can imagine this. Just do it the way we've always done it, right? Okay. So anyway, all right. Uh, so what do I do? Um, Jeanette Winterson, who is a, a poet, said, well, you must find a boat and sail in it. No guarantee of shore, only a conviction that what she wanted could exist if she dared find it, all right? So, as von Kohn would say, choose the heuristic to use from what you have, you know about at the time you're required to choose, right? 
and leave yourself an out, you know, back, back up. All right. So let's talk about state of the art for a little bit. All right. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm from the school way before 1995 when I started programming. I won't tell you what decade it was, but it was way long before that. Emacs was a great advancement. Um, but um, anyway, so you can look at this um, sort of. Um, so we each have our own cherished set of heuristics, and some of them are formed by the time we started doing things, right? And uh, as new ones become useful, we add them to our collection. They not, may not be what feels natively familiar to us, at least I feel that way, as I, but I just have to get over it and move on, right? My last small talk program was in 2001, so it was in this millennium, but anyway. Um, and no longer useful uh, heuristics fall out of fashion, so things I learned to do when memory was really tight, I don't have to think about anymore, unless I'm writing, uh, you know, embedded code. Um, and sometimes even useful heuristics fade away because they're not supported by a community that keeps them alive and, and growing. So even though I like that small talk browser, you know, it's like, okay. I'm gonna have a design uh, session pairing with uh, a client that I've been working with for the last five years, and we're using Vim. You know, it's like, what? No browser, you know, browsers are for people who go slow, you know. Anyway, he really, anyway, so. All right. So there, there really is no substitute when you're talking about cultivating your experience from learning from your, your experience and reflecting on it. And so um, the first lesson to learn is that nothing ever goes exactly by the book. Um, I'm going to give you an example here from a non-software world. But I remember when I wrote my book long ago, uh, the first blue book, um, that <laughs> a gentleman, about two years after the book had been out there, and he, he, he phoned me up. This is like before the internet was really working very well. And he said, man, I'm, I'm so disappointed in, in what's happening when I try to pe teach people responsibility-driven design from your book. And he said, I cannot get any of my students to create the ATM design exactly as is, is in your book, right? He expected that if he did the recipe of all the principles, that they would end up with exactly the same design as, I had in, as we had in our book. And I'm going, all right, anyway. That was, so nothing ever goes exactly by the book, and there's so much variation. So, how many of you have heard of Blue Apron? You know, for those of you who are not a Blue Apron, I got a gift certificate, and so now I'm uh, addicted to Blue Apron, but they send you a box of stuff uh, with all the right ingredients and recipes, and all you have to do is make it, all right? But nothing ever goes by the recipe. So here's a recipe that was early in my career of, I've been uh, Blue Aproning for about eight, since, since, since Christmas time when I got the present, um, of a, a, a broccoli salad. Just, it was kind of a nice winter meal. And there's actually the picture of what, I took a picture of my meal. So I'm like, wow, right? Uh, it looks almost like it. But one of the things you notice, if you look at, and uh, you flip over the, the recipe card and it's like in an eight and a half. One of the things you notice is that there's different degrees of precision that they, they put in there. And when you first start doing this, it drives you nuts. You're supposed to cook your egg exactly nine minutes, right? Exactly nine minutes, right? Not eight and a half, not nine minutes and 15 seconds, I guess. I just had a minute timer, so whatever. Um, and that. Uh, Sometimes they give you a range, okay, 30, 30 seconds to a minute, you know, and here's what, 20 to 22 minutes, or if not, I'm going to say browned and tender when pierced with a fork, so I have to do something and check, right? Okay. 
And, and so, and then there, what's this drizzle? How much, my husband asked me this, I remember. It's like, how much is a drizzle? <laughs> right, oh, it's like, okay. Um, it's whatever comes out when you turn the oil. Oh. And, and then um, there's, there's this judgment that they keep pushing on you, as much of the garlic as you, as you would like, right? And they do this in the other recipes too, like as much of the hot, spicy thing as you like. But until you taste it, you don't know how hot and spicy the things are. And then <clears throat> they do their, their incessant, all the steps that they ask you to, to add salt. You know, I'm adding salt when I do the eggs, and I'm adding salt here, and I do it there. First time did that, just oh, way too salty. Because it's not like you can taste um, everything and see what the salt adjustment is. So, so to my, my point is when someone gives you a heuristic where they've written it in this complex pattern forms, sometimes they, it may appear that something is precise. Maybe it really isn't nine minutes, you know? And what if you live at altitude? I don't know, boiling and, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're probably just thinking about that. No, it doesn't work here. Um, anyway, so, so nothing ever goes by the book. And you have to learn over time to apply your judgment, right? So by definition, you're going to make mistakes, right? You just, you just are. Um, and so let's look at some, uh, you know, getting back to a software example, of pesky details about validation and constraint checking, you know, which some of those uh, tactical patterns in domain-driven design. You know, if users are giving you something that they're typing in in the browser and it's coming across, what do you do? You can, you know, you, you, even though they didn't talk about it, it's like, how much should I validate in the browser? Um, do I do hand validation code or a declarative style? Or um, how much validation is performed by framework-specific classes? For those of you who are doing Java programming, you know there's like a, a boodle load of framework classes and annotations and things you can do, you know, that don't put it inside your domain objects. You could do that. And then, you know, constraint checking. Which objects get those responsibilities? When, are they, when, are, when do you enforce them? And, you know, what if there are two attributes within the same object or cross-object constraints? You know, what, there's a lot of pesky details. And, Al, uh, you know, uh, Eric just has the, you know, constraint and specification object, and Fowler had a little bit there, but you're like, you got to figure this out because they didn't tell you, right? Um, so I have these sets of, I used to call them recommendations, but I, uh, you know, say that there really are heuristics. Simple things in the browser, you want to give people feedback. If you're doing it in multiple places, you want to make sure that the feedback is consistent. Um, don't universally trust edits, reapply them if you get from an untrusted source. Um, and then if I'm using those Java framework-specific validation mechanisms or classes or whatever, I better do them consistently. So I, I want to develop over time heuristics that lead to consistency in the way I'm building something if it's going to stand over time. Um, and then domain layer validation to constraint. Uh, uh, constraint. Okay. But even then, you know, Eric gave us different ways of doing things, right? So you could create separate classes for variable validating constraints. Um, and there are little tiny things that you could check the rules on, and they were particularly useful when you had multiple domain objects that you wanted to validate, so one didn't check on the state of the other. Um, and, wow, that allowed you to dynamically configure constraints, but it was harder to understand all the rules at once. I don't know if you said that or not, but that's something I, I came up with as I'm doing that kind of stuff. Um, and then if I'm doing them within the domain object, it's a it's, it, it changes the state. It's most direct. Um, if, if you factor it into an helper methods with a name, then you can have a discussion. I remember in the book reading about discussion with a d domain expert about what that rule should be, and they can look at uh, it. But, but it clutters the code with a lot of checking and no ability to modulate when those are enforced. You might want to do them at different times. And it's hard to configure them. But given what you know, at the point in time that you're doing this, you've got to pick some and go with it. Right? 
Um, so, if I'm thinking about heuristics, I also want to share with you some useful ways of looking at your design and code, you know, things that, so that they don't get lost and forgotten, that come from responsibility-driven design. I, I, I tend to write a book once every millennia, um, but in the second book, um, there was uh, talking about role stereotypes, and which no, the first book was the one that people read, the second one was the one that had uh, more deeper wisdom than, than the first one. Um, but there's this notion of role stereotypes, um, typical behaviors that you would find in an object-oriented system, um, and that there were six stereotypes, information holders, structurers, service providers, coordinators versus controllers that are making decisions, and then interfacers that transform re information and requests between distinct parts. And so if I, th if I think about those stereotypes or ways of looking at a design, and it doesn't even matter these days whether it's functional programming or th th these still are good ways of, of looking at and understanding a design, so there are some heuristics around this, this like early day heuristics, pre-2000 uh, you know, heuristics. You want to blend stereotypes to make objects more uh, responsible. And you want to add behaviors to make objects smarter. So they should do something with what they know or they are responsible for maintaining the state of. Um, so you could have information holders that compute or derive information based on the other information that they maintain. You know, how, how do you, you know, why not? Um, service providers that maintain information to be more efficient so they can cache information, structures that answer deeper questions about the things that they're structuring, you know. Um, interfacers that also do some deep transformations, too. But you have to be aware of overlapping competing heuristics. So I, I like this kind of style of developing systems so I have my little smart things that I add to objects. But the single responsibility principle, I always get clubbed over the head with that when people look at my code, oh, Rebecca, but that, you could have, should have put that in a separate object because it's doing, um, actually, I think the single responsibility, this should be in yellow, by the way. It's, it's that way on my screen. Um, uh, they're competing and overlapping. Make the, my goal was to make the overall system simpler by having objects do something with what they know, not overstepping their bounds, but doing something with what they know so that you can you know, not have to have all these other objects that are hard to understand. So you know, there's, there's uh, uh, competing and overlapping heuristics. So here's a couple of, I just want to make a, a slight digression into some heuristics and I said, one of the things about heuristics is they are in danger of getting lost if there isn't a community around them, as there is with domain-driven design. Peter Code you know, and his colleagues were responsible for writing about streamline object modeling. And I learned some things from them that I've boiled down into pithy heuristics, um, that you want to separate out the stuff that varies depending upon the current relationships. And so if you believe when you're, you're you know, understanding, and this is just a simple example of that, um, Fowler talks about it in his analysis patterns too. Uh, if something is gonna vary and change over time, the role, role of a person is going to change over time, and I heard this talk about uh, person or the person object this morning that, that grew out of bounds with all the different roles, I'm saying, separate that stuff out depending upon the current relationship. Um, well, another thing I learned is that location can be really hierarchical would be nice, but a lot more complex. So if I'm looking at an airport, you know, I have a gate within a, within a wing and it's in a particular airport, that's, that's nice and structured, but, but if you're doing tel telephone tariffing and things like that, um, what a location is, is actually a really complicated thing. Um, and talking about events, and I don't know if I, I haven't heard people talk about this in the terms of, they talk about events um, as things that have happened, but they can be, a, uh, streamline object modeling offered this 
kind of rich way of thinking about it, and in some of the systems I've built, they've been useful. I can publish events that are point in time, this happened, the order arrived, I, I, but they can also be a, um, an interval, you know, uh, describe something, a, a set of time. So it can be, a, here's, in this time window, we got, we got this order, or anyway, um, and that can be actually, they can depend on other events, um, and, and even, uh, it's always messy and complex. Events are more complicated than you ever want them to be, but they are. Um, and so the, the final uh, thing from uh, streamline object modeling that I think you would find interesting um, is that they characterize the attributes of an entity into different kinds of attributes. And I actually think this is interesting to find interesting behaviors in the system, or at least starting having those conversations about what do we want to have the system and how do we want it to behave. Descriptive ab uh, attributes that reflect properties, not its identity, fine. Um, that there are time-dependent attributes that can change values. And if they're time-dependent, you may need to maintain a history of them. Um, and then there are these life cycle state where you go through a, a life cycle and you go one way through to a final state. Although many systems with compensating transactions, there's nothing ever a final state usually. They, they can reverse. Um, uh, and an operational state where um, they switch between different states that enables different behavior. And so thinking about the attributes that are in an, in an entity that way has, has been very helpful for me to do, to ask the questions to understand what my rich, rich model behavior should be, um, regardless of if I remember the, the, all the patterns in the, in the book. So I'm an old, crusty small talker, I confess, right? So periodically, I revisit my heuristics. I, I try to learn new things. I have clients doing... Uh, uh, very interesting stuff. So I get, that's my option to do that. But I challenge you, if you're cultivating your heuristics, your personal state of the art, to keep refreshing yourself. So, just as in a, for instance, what's different about validating and enforcing uh, constraints within a CQRS architecture, for example? Um, and I'm using just uh, people, just to show, you know, from the community uh, what, what they talked about. Um, Dan Whitaker said, well, distinguish in a blog post. And I said, he said, well, here's how he's characterizing those attributes for validation. Um, there's superficial and domain validation, whatever. Super, well, I'll give you the definition. He said, superficial are things that must be true regardless of the state of the domain. Uh, and validate those before you issue the command because you don't want to have the, um, it fail later on. Um, ideally on the client side as well as on the server side. And then he said superficial requires lookup of other. There's this other category of superficial but requires lookup of information that isn't locally available, assuming a browser. Um, so invalidate in the service before invoking the client command there too. And then he says domain ones. The validity of the command is dependent upon the state of the model, and so validated in the, in the domain objects. That was his advice. Um, and, and then he also talked about the difference that if I report any kind of validation errors or constraints, that I don't need to do it in real time. I can have errors as events, error conditions as events, too. So <clears throat> that was interesting. How do I sort these out You know, with what I just told you about my validation recommendations. Because you've got to sort them out. They're not saying the same thing. And as a designer who wants to grow, and I do, believe me, what I have to do is people use different language even to talk about what they're doing. And in order to develop my personal set of heuristics, I have to reconcile it or either toss it out because it's not in the language that I know. But if I want to grow, I've got to reconcile it. So if I think about it, um, Daniel talked about superficial versus domain validations, and I talked about syntactic versus semantic ones, and all these different kinds of attributes that I learned from code, Peter code. Um, um, and then there's the location of where you want to do things, 
and, and how do you do the constraints, which is, I'm not going to really talk about that part. But if I think about it, my first reaction, if I'm trying, oh, God, got to sort this out. <laughs> and it's after five now, so I can, like, whine and whimper about it. But I'm going to say, let's just get on with it, all right? You've got to try to reconcile things that come from different corners if you want to grow. Um, so if I do it, superficial or roughly equivalent to the syntactic stuff, but I still might want to do it if it doesn't come with an entrusted source. And semantic are roughly equivalent to domain validations, and I would also say that the time-dependent lifecycle operational ones certainly are. And in these days, when you talk about validation location, the client server is getting kind of baroque these days because browsers do, you know, many things. Anyway, so that's getting very, life is getting much more interesting. But anyway, you got to sort the stuff out if you want to grow. You're going to get things from different sources. You got to got to sort them out. But one of the things that you do need to be aware of is be aware of dogma. You know. Um, people that say, this is the way, um, they're wrong. <laughs> um, they're partially right. This is a way that works for them. Um, you have to be pragmatic about it. And if somebody's heuristics that they're trying to uh, explain to you seem too rigid, like thou shalt always do, and actually Daniel did not write that way, um, then that, to me, that turns me off right away. It's just like, oh my goodness. Um, you shall have no more than one single uh, responsibility or method per class. No, that's not what they meant. Uh, but, but you, sh you must always do this. So, so, so you've got to sort it out, but don't, you know, when people give you a dogmatic way to do something and you're trying to incorporate it, um, you know, you, you watch out. I want to kind of end on talking about how do you keep heuristics that a, you know, a community of domain-driven design folks, they need champions, right? They may fade from fas fashion because, well, Peter Code you know, retired, right? <laughs> you know, he doesn't do what he does anymore, so he didn't champion that anymore, and his folks have moved on. Um, kind of sad, but true. Um, so there's three different ways that you could advocate uh, and champion heuristics and challenge them at the same time. So you might um, write books or blogs or case studies. I love the case study part of this conference. It's really great. Everything I learned to do wrong and then how I figured it out and then I did it, something else wrong. Anyway, they're, they're, I really love those. Anyway, they're my favorite thing. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, the experience report um, uh, program director for the Agile Alliance. If someone wants to write an experience report about Agile intersecting with domain-driven design, I would accept you and you could write eight pages and get a free ticket to next year's conference. Because I want to have domain-driven design ideas and design coming back to the Agile community. So, all right. Um, so if, I've heard some good experience stories. If you want to talk about it, that would be, uh, come talk to me. Um, anyway, so, here he is. <laughs> okay, uh, Vladik, and he, he, I, I, he, I uh, just by chance, I was, I'm surfing the internet, finding critique, you know, from domain-driven design, and he says, you know, uh, one of the first techniques is blogging critique. And he goes, what if we just removed those tactical patterns? And he's, he's sort of apologizing in his blog. He says, well, I talked to Eric, and Eric, Eric mentioned that at the conference, and then you, then you talked about it. You know, Eric didn't write about it in a blog. Vladek did. And he basically said, you know, those were never intended to be cons uh, one and only one way to do things, so just get rid of them. Right? Boom. <laughs> All right. Um, but actually, you know, <laughs> but actually, I don't think he really meant that. But anyway, um, if remember we talked about pattern languages earlier. I actually think that <laughs> the bounded contexts were wrong around these patterns originally, right? And that um, that there probably were two different languages here um, that are related and there are pattern languages of pattern languages. 
And, and, and so there's the strategic stuff, and then there's this more tactical stuff, and we have to do both, and that's just one way of doing it, fine. We need to write about that now. We need to talk about it that way. And I'm, by the way, the big ball of mud is not Eric's pattern, but it's actually a whole set of patterns. It's a great paper to read about how to keep things working that are crappy. Um, and and th th that's just sort of, we're going to have to keep doing that sort of stuff. Um, and since that time, I've collaborated with Joe Yoder and wrote some more patterns that weren't in that ball of mud that I've figured out on systems. So we wrote some extensions to that. So, so anyway, there was probably a context, you know, bounded context was wrong. You know, it needed to be split. Even though the book was split, the people, the map was there, you know. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> so another advocacy technique is journaling, you know. Describing your design principles for yourself, for your team, for your fellow designers. Um, and I think that they should be not apple pie and motherhood statements, as we say in the US. That's a US phrase, so it probably doesn't translate to German or whatever. Uh, it does, but it probably doesn't have the same meaning. Uh, but you want to have uh, a voice about, well, maybe you do prefer a rich domain model in certain cases. Um, one of the things I know, uh, a client that I was working with recently, that they had this sort of principle that they were implementing services and services weren't, you know, there were some services that were aggregate roots, others that are not, many that are not. And they wanted to avoid this, you know, creating spaghetti dependencies in a monolith. And they had this rule that said aggregate roots should never directly communicate with each other. There should be another service that, that does the kind of communications. You, maybe you have certain communication protocols and why, or way your events are structured. Um, and conventions, or how do we configure things? You know, just and and maybe you want to journal about when you th when you discovered you could break the rules, right? The heuristics that you had backed you into a corner. Um, I also think it's interesting to to document document. I don't mean like a thousand page document. Describe the decisions as you're developing something because. Your decisions are part of your state of the art too, and when you when you made them and what you learned. Um, so some things that you might want to justify are things that you spent time on, or they were really critical to get something right, or everybody is confused. Then then just describe it why you did it. Um, so I think you know why did I make the decision? Um, other things I might have considered. If you have the time, just even write the names of some th other options. Um, and appreci some appreciation of your thought process. This is what we knew at the point in time, um, and why this is, uh, is a good solution, whatever I chose to do as a, as a design heuristic. Uh, if it's an application of a pattern or, or some architectural style or whatever. And now, this is, uh, I, I recommend that you go look on GitHub. There's a project about decision records there. Um, and so that you can actually check them in with your code, right? So they're there. OK, I, I like that idea. Um, anyway, um, the one option that I like, because it's sort of in a pattern form, maybe that's my bias, and it's uh, Michael Nygaard. Um, said one to two pages of text describing, uh, you know, a title, the forces at play, the decision, we are doing this. Um, and then he has a status, so it has a life cycle. I like that. Proposed, accepted, deprecated, superseded. I thought that was pretty cool. And then the consequences, uh, uh, you know, what, what will happen. So anyway, I, I've lately been getting uh, clients that I've been working with just, you know, document those decisions and put it close to the code. So I like decision records. That's a good idea. Um, but at the end of the day, expect your state of the art and your practices to evolve um, based on what you learn by actually doing things. Um, and, and it's not going to be the same today as it was five years ago. Uh, and one of the things 
to do is don't throw out what you've found has worked as you add new heuristics and nuances. Um, like, here he is again. Um, one of the things that Cohen says is that make small changes to your state of the art. You know, don't, don't just pivot and say, everything I learned about domain-driven design was wrong, and now I'm going to functional programming to hell with it, right? Really? OK. Um, so do it based on your learn, what you learn. Um, as a community, growing and keeping a community alive, I actually think having these discussions, it's nice to, I went and surfed and found blogs, and, but it would be really nice if they were organized in a way that we could all learn from each other, there are, you know, a Slack channel for domain-driven design or whatever. Um, uh, I just got it, I don't, <laughs> I don't, sure, I just got invited to another Slack channel today and I'm going, oh, not another one. Anyway, but maybe, maybe there would be something, something like that, more active. Um, and pay attention to what happens when you apply a new to you heuristic. It's okay to stumble around for a while, um, but don't, f don't forget those things that, because you develop your preferred style, don't ignore those other things either. Like, kind of open your brain from time to time. Um, so one of the things to do is that, uh, and I end with this thought, and I will, I will really end, okay, um, is that cultivating heuristics requires care and attention. And so, um, I found this, and I thought this is really appropriate if we keep this, uh, the cheese metaphor, in that um, there are actually four ways of making cheeses taste, and there's microbes that can be used in a variety of ways. I don't expect you to read this, but it, it's, it's kind of an interesting thought. Modern mass-produced cheeses just inject one or, you know, and, and they don't have really good taste. They're just kind of, well, cheddar, blah, um, or whatever. But if you have a rich context and have, you know, those European cheeses that you can't buy in the U.S. because for some reason they're illegal to import, because, I don't know, they, they, they think they will harm us, or um, anyway, or maybe it's a trade agreement or whatever, that sort of artisanal cheeses, which I think that our state of the art is that way, um, is that they have a in more interesting blend or mix um, of, of these ingredients. They don't just inject one and say, boom. So I think design really is that. The, when you want to get something really cool, you're going to have to blend and, and figure it out and cultivate it. And it requires care and attention. So. That's what I want to say. Um, thank you.